Hey, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Simon says, my research partner, Paul, is hiding at the back there. Um, he decided that the obligation to act for this one was mine, so <laughs> here I am. Just uh, acknowledgements that we've sourced the images, credited them. It's, it's really great to see so many people in the room. Uh, when Paul and I started working in this area, ethics was very much on the sidelines, and we almost had to justify why we were bothering to raise it as an issue. Um, people didn't seem to understand that there was a problem, so it's, it's great to see so many people here. And this uh, next slide shows the number of publications that have come out in recent years that really highlight um, and summarize a lot of the key issues, lots of frameworks, <coughs> codes of practice from JISC, from the OU, uh, from New America, all sorts of, uh, and LACE, of course. So it, it really is becoming part of the mainstream thinking, we think. And in fact, uh, the LACE guys uh, said as part of their report that does knowing more about our students bring a responsibility to act on, on what we've learned? And what are the ramifications of not doing something with what we know about our students? We know that um, universities and colleges have certain obligations, uh, but they tend to be very well-defined obligations. And they're around um, issues like uh, non-discrimination, um, making sure that students aren't bullied, um, protecting students from physical or mental harm. But what we don't have, as far as we, aware, we are aware, is any formal obligation to, for, for an institution to provide support to a student to prevent them from failing, even if we know that they may be at, um, at risk. So what we've tried to do here is to explore some of the thinking around that, which, which hopefully may uh, give us some ways forward. We know that the way that uh, universities and colleges respond um, is affected by, by these various factors, uh, that universities can sometimes choose or opt not to act on current educational theory um, because it may be deemed irrelevant given the short-term pressures that they're facing. We know that um, institutional policy uh, development focuses on research findings when it's most convenient politically, when it fits in with uh, what's going on with the political climate at the time. We know, all of us will know, that uh, there are silos within our institutions, that people don't talk to each other, that uh, knowledge is not shared, that systems and tools are developed in, for a module, uh, in a faculty, and that uh, thinking across the units is not commonly shared. An area that Paul and I have looked at is uh, where we're constrained by resource and how we allocate resource to which group of students. So uh, we've done a bit of work on what we've called triage um, and how we decide whether we abandon the students that are most dead uh, because any support may not actually save them or make any difference and whether we focus on those students for whom just a little nudge would have the biggest impact and what are the ethical implications of doing that and how transparent are we about that. But sort of supporting all of this, of course, is the responsibility of students to act and to take some responsibility for their own learning and success. And uh, yeah, just uh, underlying that point that uh, we're not saying that students have no responsibility. Of course they do. Uh, so anything that we put in place doesn't excuse students from taking responsibility for their own learning. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first presentation we gave, we had maybe five people in the room. <laughs> <laughs> really weird. Shall the folks move back just to make a bit more space for those So what we've tried to do is to look at the ethical dimension and the legal dimension. And um, I, I will s definitely state up front that neither Paul nor I have a legal background. We've tried to find out what we can that's relevant to the field. So if any of you are, are lawyers, please don't attack us. Um, we've done our best to find out what's relevant here. But we're going to take a look at the ethical side first. Um, and most of us will be aware of what we call the uh, deontological side of ethics. And, and that tends to be rule-based. So we'll set up frameworks, we'll set up codes of practice, and we think that we're OK. That's, you know, we have a code, we have a policy. We have a policy at the OU. Um, I'm not sure it, it's really making fundamental difference to our practices yet, but we do have a policy so we can feel really good about ourselves. On the other side is uh, the teleological side. 
which is more about um, creating shared norms, um, getting consent, in, consent that's informed so that the students actually understand what it is we're doing and we're all agreed on the approach that we're taking. And the last question and uh, co have gone a step further and said that actually if we want to do even better we need to combine all of these well most or all of these different approaches which look at things like uh, uh, an approach for the common good you know not just for the individual looking at what's fair what's just um, and basic rights etc etc so I'm racing because I know that Simon's told me to go fast on the legal side we actually found it really difficult um, we, we did find this statement um, that there is no duty to rescue a person. If you, if you came across somebody who was drowning, there is no obligation on you to save them legally. Even if it's really easy, even if you can, you can just step into the water and pull them out, you are not legally bound to rescue somebody. But we think it goes a bit beyond that. So what we found in terms of uh, education was was this and this uh, this work by Massey which uh, came out in 2008 relates really to um, students who are at risk of suicide so it's very you know it's in that context but it's pretty much the only thing that we could find that related and what she says is that there is a duty to rescue where the dangerous situation is created which causes a person to fall into peril and then the person that, who's created the context who set up the context has a duty to act and also where there's a special relationship between the two parties um, for example parents children employers employees and universities and students and we're arguing i think that in in this case universities and colleges take on that obligation to rescue its students because we formally agree to register them to accept them into our institutions <coughs> And in fact, in the, in the US at least, there is a, a legal um, precedent that says that, that there is some accountability when there is a special relationship between two parties. And in this context, between a higher education institution and students, even when the students are adults, so we're not just talking about um, younger children here, if these conditions arise, if we, if we think that, that there may be some potential harm which we, we could identify up front, so we know that there's a danger of students failing if we don't act, uh, if, we, if we accept that doing nothing could lead to a student failing, and if we are taking money from the students, so this is the mutual dependence um, which normally relates to a financial benefit, so we're accepting money from, from a student, we have a financial, uh, we have a legal responsibility to and a duty of care to look after them and if we don't do that then uh, we are morally blameworthy that's a legal term so that's the context um, as I say the legal stuff is a bit shaky there's not very much out there but I think that in itself speaks volumes that that uh, we've put a lot of thought into ethics we've put a lot of thought into legal frameworks for other types of situations but not into this particular one so uh, what we're trying to do is to, is to sort of bring it to your attention that uh, maybe there is more of an obligation to act. And to highlight some of this, uh, we've just put together case studies based on our own institutions. Uh, the first is the Open University where I'm based and, and we do a lot, a lot, a lot in learning analytics. We have some great thinking, some great tools, uh, which we try to roll out. And one of my responsibilities at the moment is trying to operationalize uh, the OU Analyze tool Where's uh, Stenick? Somewhere in the audience. Hello. Which is fabulous. <laughs> um, so we've, got, we've done all this fantastic research. How do we actually make use of it? Um, and so a, a team have been piloting, giving this information to a group of self-selecting tutors, tutors who volunteered to use this information. Uh, getting weekly reports on students who, uh, with probabilities of their um, likelihood of submitting their next assignment. And what the initial pilots have found is even with that group of tutors who have opted into such an exercise, the levels of engagement are quite low. And part of the, part of the thinking behind that is um, around their readiness to use tools, their um, development needs. There are a whole bunch of factors which I'm sure we're all aware of. But in our context, there is no obligation for our for our teaching staff to use student information in this way. There's nothing in their contracts that says <laughs> that they're required to do anything. We just have some uh, very sort of uh, fluffy guidance about good practice. 
Um, and in our case, again, I mentioned the OU policy. We have stated specifically in that policy that we have a responsibility to use and extract meaning from student data for the benefit of students, and yet we don't enforce that. I'm not saying enforcement is the answer, but we don't even try to make it um, a condition of a tutor's performance. In uh, UNISA's case, which is uh, an even bigger open distance learning institution in, in uh, Pretoria, which serves South Africa and other parts of Africa, around 300,000 students, they have a slightly different situation. Uh, most of their courses are technology supported, which means they, they use technology, um, but they're not dependent on technology. So students don't have to go into forums. They don't have to access online materials. Their support is provided by uh, teaching assistants on some courses and e-tutors on other courses, and they have different contracts. Um, the teaching assistants teach huge numbers or support, support huge numbers of students and all of their time really, most of their time is spent marking assignments, around 10 assignments per student per semester, 200 students they support uh, and they spend all their time just trying to keep up with that work and dealing with admin. E-tutors provide rea reactive student support so they're not teaching the students the academic content Again, they have little or no follow-up for students who may be disengaging. Uh, and in Uni UNISA's context, there's, there's no policy which um, suggests that we should even be using learning analytics or student data to support their learning. And as Paul told me that uh, um, this is thought of as a future initiative. Their use of technology is, is somewhat behind ours, perhaps in the UK. At the moment, it probably wouldn't even be feasible for them to, to use learning analytics in this way. So what we've tried to do is to come up with some pointers about the things that we might think about. There isn't an easy solution to any of this, so just understanding what the obligation to act might mean. The first point is, is recognising that we both have a responsibility, the student and the institution have a co-responsibility, bearing in mind that the institution holds more power, if you like. It's not a, it's not a balance, it's not an equal relationship. Um, we know a lot more about our students. We, we can choose what they do. Their next steps sometimes are constrained by what we allow them to do. So in that case, we have very specific um, legal duties or moral duties, certainly, to respond, to support them. We need to understand, uh, um, this is a, an old point if you like, but we need to understand what data can tell us. We need to make sure that uh, we're clear on how we're collecting our data, whether it's biased, um, any unintended consequences, that just knowing more about students doesn't, or having more data doesn't mean that you know more about them. But, but the, the actual uh, proactive, the deliberate collection of that data increases the need for us to do something with it. Otherwise, why, why are we doing it? Uh, referring back to the deontological approach, which most of us, I think, would probably assume is, is enough, or a lot of people have assumed is enough till now, uh, having a policy, having a set of terms and conditions which set out what we do isn't enough. We need to go further than that, and we need to engage with our students uh, and other staff, other key stakeholders, to agree what is an ethical approach. Uh, in my own institution, we... Um, we explored the issue of opt-out for learning analytics, and that was a step too far, um, it was at this time anyway. So we've agreed uh, something called informed consent, where we just have a single sentence as part of a registration agreement, which tells students that we do stuff with their data. There's a link to further information about what we do with their data. Even getting that single sentence in, into the registration agreement was 18 months of work. You know, it's so... Don't assume that this is easy. Uh, it's not easy to do. Yeah, the legal basis is the tricky one. At the moment, there are massive gaps here. So um, I put it there because it's the big gap in the room. We can have our ethical principles and our codes of practice, but quite often I think you'll find um, that institutions won't enforce things, won't move this on unless... Uh, unless there's a sort of legal basis for it, unless there's a real driver um, for the obligation to act. And the case studies we're talking about uh, accountability. 
certainly in our case, we feel that the contracts that our teaching staff have do not reflect the uses of student data that we'd like, you know, we'd, we'd like them to act upon. So just having the tools, <coughs> spending years developing tools which are very clever, which can tell us all sorts of things as researchers, is not enough. If people won't actually engage with that, do something with that information, uh, we need to change contracts and obligations so that they do. However, uh, that's not easy. There are other contexts, um, in other institutional policies which often conflict with some of this. And just having the policy by itself doesn't mean that we'll necessarily do, do everything that we should be doing. Um, we have a very basic tracking tool at the OU, which is a simple sort of binary. Has the student submitted their assignment? Yes, no. Um, have they registered late? Yes, no. A whole combination of different factors. What we can't do is act on all of that information. There are just too many students to, to contact. So even knowing that we should and wanting to do something quite simple with it, we just can't do it. So we're back again to the triage question of who do we target and on what basis? Um, you know, who decides? And that's quite a big question in itself. Are we, are we looking at um, success for the institution, which really means retention of students, um, which is all about money, let's be honest. It's about um, protecting the income of the university over, over years, making sure they come back and register for another, another module. Or are we acting in the best interests of the students and allowing those who are struggling to achieve their end goal, even if it's not particularly uh, great for the university, even if they decide actually that was really hard and I'm going to stop there. So somebody needs to, we need to have discussions within our own institutions which highlight how we're making those decisions and what things are really important to us. And the last point is really um, summarising what I've said, that we need to really think about the responsibilities which come from knowing more about our students. It's not enough just to know, we need to understand and then what? What does that mean? What, what should we do about it? Uh, the last one is just to flag that um, even though that's really difficult stuff, it's going to get harder. Um, there are there's other really clever artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, the use of algorithms and the, the whole sort of bias issue in coding um, coming along, which make it even harder. So it's just a sort of aid memoir on the end there. Just to summarise. So knowing more about our students, making information available, doesn't necessarily result in action. Just having a rule-based response isn't enough. We need to think about um, getting some agreement around norms and um, codes of ethics, if you like, between students particularly and other key stakeholders. And understanding that uh, there are things that impact on our ability to act, such as resource, you know, money, um, lack of political will, institutional silos, all sorts of other issues, but that doesn't excuse us from not doing something. You know, recognising that those things exist doesn't excuse us from doing nothing with it. And there we are. Okay, thanks, Sharon. Um, well, you rocketed through that. We have a, some good time for discussion. Um, so I'll just let you take questions as, as people put their hands up. Hi. Um, you framed most of the epic question here as, given that we have a certain amount of information, do we have an obligation to act on that information? And I wonder about the prior question, which is given the availability of tools which would allow us to acquire information which we could act on, do we have an obligation to acquire that information? So the difference between what do I do given what I know about my students and is it okay if I just don't look at the students? Yeah, that's, <coughs> that's a, an interesting question because it's the opening of Pandora's box in a way, isn't it? It's if you, if you deliberately choose not to look, is that okay? And I would say, no, obviously it's not okay. You know, if we pretend that we don't know that something's going on, you know, that's just, we're, we're just fooling ourselves and everybody else. So, so clearly we need to, to explore. I think now that everybody, uh, institutions realize that learning analytics is here, um, however um, undeveloped some of the approaches are and untested perhaps, we have an obligation to, to use it, to seek that out, yeah. 
Um, so I think given that this, we're talking about outcomes over time, it's inherently kind of a consequentialist moral argument. And I'm glad that you talked about po power dynamics and who stands to benefit and gain yeah. in terms of retention and things like that within the context of performance in school. So I'm wondering what happens if there's, like just to give kind of a case scenario, what happens if there's a student where staying in school and performing well and achieving <coughs> course completion, graduation, all those milestones, means that they're sacrificing, say, family obligations, or they incur more of a debt burden, or things like that. So if we look at the whole kind of context of, of what consequences might be at play, how does that factor into your question through your model? That's really interesting, because we haven't really explored that side. I guess we've looked at um, the responsibility of the institution and the, and the choices and options it allows a student to make. or. Uh, we haven't looked at whether or not a student should be supported in their broader choices and how that impacts on other people around them. Uh, I think somebody this morning made the point about not allowing or doing something or not, sorry, not doing something with information about a student which allows them to fail and get into debt is unethical. And I'd agree with that. I don't know how far I'd agree with allowing a student who struggles to study and giving and throwing support at them and helping them to get through, even though it's impacting on their family, say, I, is unethical. I'm not sure. That's a whole different ball game, I think. Yeah, tricky. Have you? Uh, I I would think there are a lot of similarities between this kind of discussion and, and learning and the medical field. I mean, we do a lot of our analytics comes from the medical field. And how they, have you looked at how they? Because they have. To they have the same dilemma. Do they intervene or do they not intervene? We know this smoking is bad for you. What do we do to help you not smoke? So yeah. We have only insofar as the, the, the sort of do we allow them to die question, but we haven't really, um, you know, do we just provide no support at all because they're already too ill, if you like to say. But we haven't really gone into depth in terms of um, with this no, we haven't, we haven't looked at that fine a, a level of detail, I'd say. I mean, we could, but it's, it's already complicated enough, I think. The, the basic triage question is, is complicated enough at this stage, and, and most institutions haven't engaged even with that. But we, we could go one step further, for sure. Yeah. Hi. Have you had any feedback from students about the policy at uh, We have. Uh, we consulted quite extensively with students as part of, of that work. So we had um, an open discussion. We gave them information about the sorts of things that we were thinking about doing before we implemented the policy and asked them how they felt about very broad things, you know, about um, how their data might be used, whether or not they felt it was okay for us to use it in delivering support to them. And they got very um, upset about a whole range of things. They got very upset about things that actually weren't very important, um, things that were, well, that's not too, uh, <laughs> I'm not dismissing their concerns, but things that were well covered uh, around things like data protection, which we are very tight on in, in the UK and in the EU for sure. Um, you know, sharing their data with third parties, you know, that's all completely tight. So we don't worry too much about that because we're bound to do that anyway. Um, very small things they got concerned about, um, but also the bigger issues around, actually, <coughs> it's my decision, you know, okay, you may be able to help me, but I'm an adult, so butt out. And they were really keen to have the opt-out facility to say, actually, I don't want you doing this, you know, I'd, I prefer to be excluded, <coughs> or at least to have the option to make that decision. So how did you overrule the students? Uh, senior management overruled the students, basically, um, and it was revolution. it was a political decision, and it, it basically was a, a conflict between one uh, pro vice chancellor in our case who had a focus on student support and one who had a focus on registration, getting more students in, and they felt that telling students too much at the point prior to registration, where they were committed to us, would be a barrier to registration. So. That's how I got the one sentence in the end. Yeah, I'm not happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we don't have a Hippocratic oath in education to do no harm. Mm. And if we introduce one, that opens a very big Pandora's box. It does. Because we aim to fail quite a lot of our students. Yes. We take their money. Yes. 
we fail them, they feel miserable, they feel upset. Um, but we think that's okay because in the larger picture of the educational system, it's, uh, it's justified. Now, there's been um, suggestions that students might start suing universities because they turned up, they, did, they followed the course materials, and yeah. uh, they did the evaluations, but they failed. I think that's How already that happened. Right? Yeah. Pounds, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think these issues that you're raising specifically for learning analytics actually have wider um, question marks raised about our relationship with our students in the in. in they do. Which are all being raised by these. Yeah, and particularly for Paul and myself, you know, with an open distance right. learning institution where we ha we have no prior students need no prior qualifications to come and study with us, and they commit themselves to debt you know, by signing up for loans up front. Uh, they can come in and be completely unprepared. But what we do try to do now, as part of a basic tracking at least, is to catch them at an early enough point to say, and we, and it, again, difficult conversations. We never say, we don't say, you're never going to pass. Uh, we try and phrase it in a warmer, have you, you know, are you prepared? Have you thought about, perhaps you've signed up to do too much? And we found when we piloted some of the approaches that it led to more withdrawals, but those students were more likely to come back and do something else, you know, that they were more likely to succeed with. So that was a good approach, I think. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to have to call time. Uh, but